I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. And we'll be looking at what baptism symbolizes this morning. I want to take a few moments, and normally we have a time of communion, celebrating the Lord's table. We're not doing that this morning. And normally we have a time of elder prayer, uh, where one of the pastors of this church leads us together as a body in prayer before the Lord. So we're going to take just a little bit of time and do that this morning. Uh, I'm going to pray. Uh, Pray along with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the gospel that saves sinners. Every one of us in this room who knows you can attest to your kindness, your overwhelming love to those who were unlovely, unworthy. We were in rebellion against you. We sinned in our attitudes and our actions, and we needed rescue. And we thank you that you are a God who rescues. There is no one beyond your ability to save. You have told us, O God, that we are to be a a peaceable kind of people in the earth. Having been rescued by you, we are to pray. We are to pray for all kinds of people, for kings and those who are in authority, precisely because you can save And so we lift up to you our nation's leaders. We pray for our president. We pray for our legislators at a national level. We pray for our governor and those who lead and govern us at the local level. God, we pray for the the sword which the government bears to punish wrong and to reward right. We grant that no earthly government has ever done this perfectly, but we recognize that that every president, every governor, every legislator, every mid-level bureaucrat will give account to you for how they lead and serve people on the earth. Lord, that's a scary thought. So our prayer for them would be that they would do well, that they would serve you by serving in government. We pray that you would bring repentance where there is rebellion, that you would bring faith where there is unbelief, that you actually would save presidents, governors, legislators, local law enforcement, and everything in between, because you are the kind of God that saves all kinds of men. We pray in response that we would be in subjection because we want to honor you, our true king. God, we thank you so much for preserving Denny Pagel, for getting him through his illness, and bringing him home from the hospital. God, we praise you for your sustaining grace in that. You are the God who heals. You are the God who is sovereign over physical malady. I thank you for those in this body who were an encouragement in a timely fashion to Denny and to Barb. We pray that you would bring a complete recovery and bring Denny back to full uh, usefulness in this church and in his home. God, we thank you for your kindness in putting so many young ones in our church. We pray that the homes where these children find themselves would be filled with the gospel, filled with your word, proclaimed, modeled, taught. We pray that you would raise up a generation of young ones who will know you early on in life and who will follow you all of their days. Would you use this little army to be gracious heralds of your saving gospel all their days. God, we pray for our time today. We, we think of those who have come to be baptized and we ask that you would give them boldness and courage to give testimony of your grace in their lives. We thank you for Jen Shah and Josie and Fernie and Abigail and Gavin and Hannah and Emma and Josie. And we ask even now as they tell us what you have done that you would receive all glory. And God, would you stir our hearts with compassion for the lost, conviction about the truth, 
And for any who are here in this room who do not yet know you, who have not experienced forgiveness of sin and transformation of life, would you be pleased even this day to bring salvation? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're looking at the book of Romans and put your eyes on chapter 6. Paul says in verse 2 of Romans 6, How shall we who died with reference to sin still live in it? And this rhetorical question brings out an important truth. All those who are under the reign of grace, Romans 5, 20 and 21, all who have been saved by God's love have been removed from a tyranny to sin. They have died in their relationship to sin. That is a truth of every Christian. Everyone is born in sin and lives in sin and walks in sin. It's the air we breathe. It's the things we think. It's who we are by nature. It works itself out in what we do. And those who have experienced the transformation of grace have experienced a death, a kind of spiritual death, a a death to the old way of living, a death to the old self. Paul says this similarly in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. You see, when a man is born again, he dies to his old life. That's the point Paul is bringing out here. And he says, do you not know, Romans 6.3, that all of us who have been baptized or immersed into Christ have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. Here's this remarkable reality. Everyone who is in Christ has been joined to Christ so that your union with Christ means a union with Him in His death and a union with Him in His resurrection life. You need to know, friends, that a Christian is not someone who has changed his ways or cleaned up his act, or gotten religious, or pulled himself up by his own moral bootstraps, tried harder, done better. A Christian is one who through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross has died and has already been raised to new and spiritual life. If you're a Christian here today, you have experienced what the Bible calls new birth. The old things have gone away and new things have come. You are living a spiritual life when you were totally incapable of doing that before. And what is the watershed that makes this difference? The watershed is the gospel. The gospel that you're going to hear from these who are being baptized today. The gospel that has changed their lives. They're not here to tell you that they fixed themselves. That they cleaned up. That they sorted things out. They're here to boast in their Savior. That God has actually saved them from themselves and made them new creatures. What is that gospel that saves? It's very simple. God Himself, in the person of the Son... The Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to earth and was born as a baby. And he lived on this earth and he never sinned. He never sinned because he was God. He never sinned because he lived perfectly. And then he died. He willingly went to the cross, not as a victim, but as a substitutionary sacrifice to stand in our place, to die the death that we deserved. As a substitute, he took all of the sins of everyone who would ever believe and he took them on himself. So they were credited to his account. So that when Jesus the Christ died on the cross, his father looked at him 
the son of his love, as if he had committed all the heinous deeds that I had done. All the criminal acts against God that everyone who would ever believe had ever done, past, present, and future. God saw his son as the guilty one, even though he was sinless. So that Jesus, in his death, taking all of our sins, could absorb all of his father's anger against those sins and pay for it completely. That's the only way that we could be forgiven is if our sins go somewhere and the punishment for those sins is exacted, completely and totally fulfilled in the sin bearer. And then for those whose sins have been transferred to Jesus Christ by faith, those sins are removed from the sinner as far as the east is from the west. God is said to justify the ungodly in order to bring us to him. And the great news of forgiveness of sin is not just that we walk around forgiven, but our forgiveness qualifies us to have a relationship to God, to know the reason for which we were made, to actually live under His blessing and to know Him in all of His goodness. This is the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sins forgiven and adoption by grace into His family. You get to hear the stories this morning of not just an abstract idea of the gospel, but a real living trophy of God's grace. What happens in a life when the gospel invades? Now these eight who are coming to be baptized, they're going to speak in front of all of us. Public speaking might sound terrifying. This isn't public speaking. You who have been baptized here, you know this. Uh, this is, a, this is a, our living room of our family. Uh, these are our friends. And everyone who loves Jesus Christ, who's already been baptized, who has already given testimony of God's grace, as you hear these testimonies, no doubt you're going to be thinking about your own heart and your own life. You're going to be refreshed in grace again. I remember when I got saved. I remember when I gave testimony to my salvation. Oh, praise the Lord. And maybe you're here this morning and you've not experienced what these have experienced. Let me encourage you. Seek the Lord. Call out to Him. And you can be saved from your sins. They're here this morning not to tell you um, that they are becoming Christians by this water. This water is not magic. It doesn't do anything It is merely a vehicle and a symbol to give public testimony of what has already happened in their lives. And we get to hear what God has done by his grace. We'll start with Jin Shah. Would you come and tell us what Jesus has done for you? raised in a small, poor, atheist family living in China, whose parents and ancestors have farmed for a living for generations. My parents told us if we don't want to work in the field as farmers under the scor- scorching sun without much income, the only way out is to be good at school. So my sister was the first one that got a PhD in our village and now as a professor in a renowned university in China. As for me, I went to university, majored in education, where I learned English. I got interested in Western people, culture, and language. My parents couldn't afford me to study abroad, so I worked as a Mandarin teacher for three years after graduation and then applied through College Board to teach, to teach Mandarin in America on a temporary three-year visa. Then I got placed in Anthem, Arizona. I was so excited that my, my American dream came true, where I seemed to have lots of freedom. At the end of my three-year term of working, I wanted to stay here but I was struggling, not able to get another work visa to stay, break up with my boyfriend, and health concerns that I felt I was drowning in the ocean without any help. Then one day, one of my students' mom, Kelly, said, Jesus could help you. I was like, I definitely need help because I do not know how to navigate life here, and I have none. The fortune teller and the lucky charms don't seem to work at all. 
Moving forward, God has been romanticized me with many provisions, instant answered prayers. I then moved to Los Angeles for, ste- for a temporary visa, but then ran out of money soon. And then I went back to China to visit my parents. Mom was crying and depressed. Dad was yelling and cussing at God. My sister was crying, blaming me for causing hardship in our family. Everyone said, I'm brainwashed by American God. Then mom encouraged me to interview with the best international high school in my city and strictly warned me not to tell anybody that I believe in Jesus. Everything went well at the interview. The last question the HR asked me was, are you a Christian? Matthew 10, 33, whoever desi- denies, me, denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. What should I do? Obey mom outside waiting for me or God's words? I'd better go with Jesus. Yes, I said. Then surprisingly, um, the HR gave me a big hug and said, wow, you're a sister in Christ. So I was offered that job right away with a salary more than anyone there on campus. So I stayed in China for a year. I was visiting government church and underground church, but I was very confused without a solid foundation of a sound doctrine. I was financially comfortable, close to my parents, and socially respected as a teacher, but I was struggling spiritually as I still did not know God. Do I want to be materially comfortable or spiritually rich? Matthew 10, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. I chose spiritually rich. So I came back to Arizona with one suitcase and one way ticket in 2020. Then COVID started. My parents wanted me to go back as I have a comfortable life there, but I wanted to stay to be able to go to church and learn about God without any restriction. I have not been able to see my parents for four years now. I was interviewing with many schools here. They all wanted me to teach there, but nobody wanted to spend so much money to sponsor my, sponsor my work visa. My family all thought I'm going to lose everything and end up empty-handed. But just a few days before my visa expires, my uh, charter school called me and hired me right away. Not only to sponsor my work visa, but also my green card. God provided me with my job with a green card, my car, condo, and many more. But living in the desert physically and spiritually, God put me in many trials. Got COVID a few times working with 30 students. Got rear-ended in a car accident causing my uh, neck pain, lost family members due to COVID, struggling with loneliness and constant health challenges, struggling with purity, identity in Christ, and body image. I was visiting churches such as Pentecostal, Word of Faith Movement for healing and deliverance. But then I became very confused. I asked myself, who is God? What's the gospel if it is not the prosperity gospel? But God's providence, I got introduced to churches that's associated, associated with the Master Seminary. I learned about biblical healing, being united with Christ, and how to think about trials biblically. During Easter, the sermon was Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth, he confesses resulting in salvation, reflecting on my life. Who is the Lord of my life? John 6, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate some of the loaves that were filled. When my lips says, yes, Jesus, but my heart was enslaved to the lust of my eyes, lust of my flesh, comfort, pleasure of this world. My heart was bitter, self-pitied, entitled, not thankful, and not self-controlled. I have been using God to worship my own kingdom, which are my idolatries, instead of being a slave to God's kingdom. Romans 6, after being freed from sin, you become slave to righteousness. You're either a a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. There isn't a third choice. What is the wage and paycheck of sin? Romans 6, 23, for the wage of sin is death, but but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. What's the purpose of my life? 1 Corinthians 10. So whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. What's God's will for my life and why? 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the will for God that you, you are sanctified. 1 Peter 15. But as for who called you is holy, you also be holy in, all, in your conduct. How, shall, how shall, um, should I be sanctified when fully aware of my sins? Romans 6.11. So consider yourself dead to sin but alive to Christ. 
for sin shall not be master over you. But I do not feel being raised in reality. What should I do? Believe the scriptures instead of my own feelings. What does grace mean? Does it mean that God is okay with me keep sinning? No. God not only gives a grace for salvation, but also gives a grace to empower us to obey. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's long, no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. I don't have to sin because I don't live under law, but live under grace. Hebrew 4, for we don't have a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we, as we are, yet without sin. Jesus resists the temptation with the Holy Spirit and in God's words, which dwell in all believers. Kelly was right. Not only God helped me with my earthly needs, but also he satisfied the greatest need for my soul. Jesus is the bread of life. Philippians 3, for our citizenship is in heaven, and the Lord will transform our lowly body, body to be like his glorious body. So who is God then? What are his attributes? God is good. God is glorious. God is true. God is wise. God is sovereign. God is righteous. God is patient. God is all-knowing. God is everywhere. God is all-powerful. God is just. God is jealous. God doesn't change. And God is holy. God is gracious, God is faithful, God is internal, and God is love. Back to my American dream, which seems to have so much freedom. Now I understand that freedom is not free to sin, but free not to sin. And that freedom can only be found in Jesus Christ. I'm here to be baptized because of forgiving them sins and united in Jesus Christ. And I want to be held to accountable that with my new life, I aim that in this life, whatever I do, I do it for the glory of God. Thank you for listening. His job based upon your testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and evidence of transformed life is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Josie, and I am here to tell you how I came to have a relationship with God. Growing up, I was raised going to church. I lived in a small town up in northern Arizona where everyone went to church and everyone was a Christian. I always understood who God was, and I always knew that he was real, but I never seemed to fully understand my personal need for Christ. I did all the right things growing up, Awana, VBS, and youth groups. And if anyone asked, I would have said, yeah, Christ saved me, but there was no heart change. My sin was still there, and I was helpless to fight against it. But God is perfect and thankfully pulled me out of my sin. It took a trial to fully understand my need for Christ. In December of 2020, when I was 16, my dad passed away suddenly. In a matter of hours, my life was changed. That day is when I realized the urgency to know Christ. I had never lost anyone close to me before then. I couldn't get through this pain without God. I wasn't strong enough. I thought about my sin and how I had pushed Christ away my whole childhood. I realized my sin was slowly killing me. How without God, I would be helpless against it. So I would say that is the day that I truly came to know God. For as Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. And what a gift it is. Me and my mom moved down and started coming to GBC with my sisters. That's when I started understanding more about what I believed. God truly was graceful in saving people out of sin. So that is why I want to be baptized today. Not only is it a command, but it is a way for others to see how Christ truly delivers people out from under the weight of sin. God sent his son to die on my behalf, so I will live for Christ. As Acts 20, 24 says, But I do not count my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Thank you.
Josie, based upon your testimony of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the, your testimony to a transformed life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Fernie and Abigail Romo, husband and wife, are both being baptized today. Fernie, you get to lead the way. Good morning. I was born and raised in the faith. God had reached my parents before I was born. During my early childhood, I attended a Pentecostal church with my parents, and I practically grew up in Sunday school. This practice continued <clears throat> throughout my middle and high school years. During my middle school years, my parents placed me in a private Christian school, which provided middle and high school education. During my time at this school, I excelled academically. I attended chapels every Monday and Friday, and I attended Bible classes. I was also baptized in the eighth grade. My parents told me it was time for me to be baptized, although I was reluctant about the idea of being baptized. Ultimately, I, fin I followed through with the baptism in order to appease my parents. As life proceeded into my freshman year of high school, I continued to attend the chapels, and I continued to complete Bible classes. Evidently, my parents tried to live Proverbs 22, 6, which refers to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. However, on the contrary, I began to heavily practice sin. I listened to worldly music, I cursed with my worldly peers during school hours, I lusted, I lied, I cheated, I stole, I coveted, and I lived a life of immorality, impurity, and vulgarity. Yet in this state, I still attended Sunday service with my parents. At this point, however, I thought it was a waste of time. I remember my dad scolding me for such statements. I would rather stay at home to watch the English Premier League, play video games, or complete homework. Further, at the beginning of my junior year of high school, I began to secretly ad adopt an atheistic worldview and reject Christianity. I cannot comprehend how the so-called Christians were the fortunate bunch of the world to have the only truth. I would think how foolish of those silly Christians. As a result, I began to arrogantly debate my Bible teachers during Bible classes. I began to dive into philosophy and I became a burden to my Bible teachers. God bless them for their patience with me. My life at this point exemplifies 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man cannot <clears throat> understand the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. At this point in my senior year of high school, my parents were called and I was referred to the school's principal. The principal had talked with me and prayed for me. The principal also reminded me that only professing Christians were allowed to continue at that school. I was on the verge of being kicked out. I decided to tone down my atheistic rhetoric and complete my senior year at that school. I did not do this because I desired to be there or because I believed in God. Rather, I feared an expulsion would ruin my college applications. Therefore, I was also deceitful. Before my senior year ended, I received a letter from Long Beach State University. I had been accepted into their criminology program. I was eager to start my education within one of America's most liberal campuses. I could not wait to finally put an end to the Christian chapter in my life. I remember one night as I showered, I told God the following, I do not believe that you are real, but in the case that you are, please leave me alone. Thank you. Shortly after that night, I stopped attending Sunday services with my parents. I only focused on my undergrad education, my life at this point, exemplified Romans 8.5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. During my undergrad years, my sin increased. I engaged in an immoral sexual acts with ungodly females who attended my classes. I coveted material possessions. I tried my best to denounce Christ. I attended events, parties that I should not have attended. And I established relationships with um, people who did not love God. And I indulged in everything that the world offered. I loved my sin and I despised God at the same time. Overall, if I would have died then, I would have been judged heavily by most, if not all, of the Ten Commandments. 
Something interesting to note, however, in the middle of my debauchery, the thought of God would come to my mind almost every day. It was very annoying and comparable to a broken faucet that drips water every night as one tries to sleep. I desired to be free from the thought of God. However, God had other plans. During my junior year at Long Beach State, in God's sovereignty, somehow my parents began to attend a Dutch Reformed church in Paramount, California. This church belonged to the RCA denomination. I pinpoint this as a pivotal moment in my salvation. During that same year, at some point um, in my junior year, I began to understand that God was real. Um, I was parked at a parking lot at my school, and I told God that I now understand that you exist. I can no longer deny that. However, I will not make it into your kingdom because I am a sinner who sins, and I cannot maintain your laws. Therefore, there is no point to try. I now attribute this erroneous thinking to my Pentecostal upbringing, which heavily preached a works-based salvation. I now digress. My parents encouraged me to attend the Reformed Church that they attended. At that church, I cannot pinpoint when, but at some point, I understood the gospel of Christ. I understood that Christ had paid the cost of every single sin that I had committed in the past, that I committed in the present, and will commit even in the future. This was the best news I could have ever received, and it changed my life entirely. All I needed to do was place my faith in the work of Christ on the cross. My view on God changed instantaneously as well. He was no longer the great judge waiting for me to sin in order to revoke salvation for me. He was now my father who loved me before I was born and who had given it all for me. I believed in Hebrews 7.27. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. My life began to change drastically. I no longer desired to live a life of sin. I desired to live for Christ and according to his will. I wanted to, and I want to be with the Lord forever and ever. I became a new man in Christ, although I'm not sure when. Although I still sin, my heart breaks when I do. In accordance with Romans 8:15, I go to the Father for help, for his forgiveness, for his counsel, for his wisdom, and for his redemption. I continuously pray, do not forget me, O Lord, when you come for your people. As I have continued to walk with Christ, my wife now has encouraged me daily. And I thank God above all for my parents who have always prayed for my salvation and my wife who keeps me in check every day. I now live according to this text, Romans 8.30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The reason why I'm here to be baptized is to uh, declare before the brethren, before people that I love Christ, I believe in Christ, my faith is in Christ, and for, for God to continue to do his will in my life. Bernie, I think we're all glad that God did not answer your prayer to leave you alone. (laughs) Based upon your profession of faith and testimony of a transformed life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Abigail Romo, will you come boast in your Savior? Hi, my name is Abigail Serrano Romo, and this is my testimony. I eloped at the young age of 18 into an ungodly relationship that was never blessed or accepted by my parents. One year later, I was blessed with my oldest daughter, Giselle, and four years later, that marriage fell apart. Being in that marriage and getting out of it was very abusive, physically, mentally, and emotionally. It was the most painful process I've had to endure. 
I soon became a single mother back at my parents' home that now had to work and care for my oldest. It was emotionally extremely hard for me to love my daughter the way she deserved because I didn't even love myself. I tried to mask my pain in many ways. I indulged in my sinful desires to numb the hopelessness in my heart. Time and time again, I was reminded by my loving parents that the life I was living was only a path to destruction, to repent and turn to Christ. Days, months, and years, I tried by my own works, my own actions to find this Jesus. But of course, I always fell right back into my old sinful ways I truly did not understand Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It was July of 2020, in my room on my knees, when I finally realized and acknowledged that I could not do it myself, that I could not let go of my sinful desires with my own strength. There was conviction in my heart. I cried out to God. I repented of my sins. I begged Christ to change my life. I needed him. I knew that without him, I could not go any longer. Since that day, my life was never the same. It was so evident. I was no longer a slave to my sin. Christ transformed my heart, my being. I didn't desire my old ways anymore. Each day that passed, I wanted to learn more and more of my first love my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that died in my place to pay the penalty of my sins, as it says in Galatians 1.4. But not only did he die, but he rose from the dead three days later and is alive today, upholding the universe by the word of his power, seated at the right hand of God, as shown in Hebrews 1.3. I lost many friends in my transformation, but it was also worth it because one month later, the Lord brought me my best friend, my now husband, Fernie Romo. One year later, we got married. and fall of 2021, we found Grace Bible Church. God blessed us with Isla Romo, August 16th, 2022. And words cannot explain how grateful I am to God for saving me by his loving grace I never deserved. All glory to him. I'm here to be baptized because I want to be obedient to Christ's command in Matthew 28:19. Thank you. Abby, based upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and the evidence of a transformed life. It's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gavin Butcher, come tell us what Jesus has done for you. Good morning. My name is Gavin Butcher, and this is the testimony of how Jesus Christ allowed me to recognize my sinful nature and graciously gave me the heart to repent of my sins and be assured of my salvation. As long as I can remember, I was raised in a Christian life and home. My entire life, my family went to church, I attended things like Awanas, and I hung out with friends who were all Christian-based. I was also homeschooled and even had a Bible class. I was proud of my faith. When I was around 13 to 14, my father, by God's grace and providence, discovered that we were not going to a church that taught the true gospel. So we left. And with prayer and a little bit of church hopping, we found a very theologically sound church that taught the truth. From a young age, I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior and enjoyed going to church and glorifying God. But for years of my life, I took my faith for granted and lived a life of unrepentant sin. Once I got to my high school years, I had no drive to be in the Word, I stopped praying, and I felt annoyed by waking up to go to church. I knew that my sin was wrong, but when it came to my spiritual walk, I was very much a procrastinator. All the sins that I was committing made me depressed and anxious and made me feel very guilty of my sins. 
One day, about two years ago, I got in the car to go home from work. Through God's grace, I felt extremely guilty. And I felt very convicted to listen to a sermon. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I chose to listen to John MacArthur's questions and answer series. And in the first 10 minutes of listening, MacArthur brought up how guilt is one of God's greatest gifts because it lets us know that we are doing wrong. Once I heard that, I broke down in tears. At that moment, I repented and begged God for a forgiveness of my sins. This marked a change in my life. I am captive to my sins no more. I would tell my family of my sins, get spiritual counseling at my church, and find a reinvigorated passion to glorify God. This would lead me to find one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Five months ago, I moved to Tempe to attend school at Arizona State University. I am very fortunate to not have to search for a church to attend, because when my brother moved up here to attend ASU, he had already done all of the work. In my first two Sundays here at Grace, I was approached by many people about coming to things such as 414, Build, and the Young Men's Coffee, and many more. All of these resources have led me to grow as a man, to be a spiritual leader, to be rooted in the word a lot deeper, and to gain a lot of new friends in my brothers and sisters in Christ. At the end of August, I had heard about the membership and baptism classes. In the past, when I would take my faith for granted, I would never even consider the idea of getting baptized or becoming a member of a church. But now, because of radical change in my life, I felt convicted and signed up for both classes. I am here to be baptized today because I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, repented of my sins, and I want to share my union with Christ, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Romans 8, 5 through 9 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Today, I am proud to say that I belong to Christ. I am his forever, and there is nothing that can change that. Gavin, based upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and an evidence of a transformed life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hannah McCoy, come tell us what God has done for you. Hello and good morning. My name is Hannah McCoy. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For six days he created and everything was very good. He created man, Adam, and woman, Eve. He placed them there in the garden and there they worked. But the serpent, Satan, tempted them and they fell into sin, cursing all people who came after them. We are all born into sin destined to spend this life and the life to come apart from the holy, sinless God. But God, Ephesians says, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God, was made flesh, dwelt among us sinful men, and died for us. He, the perfect Holy One, took our sins upon himself so that we would not die in our sin, but would be made alive forever with him who died and rose again. I was a sinner. I lived in the lusts of my flesh, indulged in the desires of my flesh and mind, was by nature a child of wrath. Having grown up in a Christian home where my parents daily preached the gospel, I knew it. 
My parents had taught me right from wrong and had demonstrated lives lived in Christ. I knew what a Christian was, and I knew I was not it. I knew I was destined for God's wrath, but I also thought I could work my own way out. Even though I would have said that man cannot bring himself to salvation, I still tried. When I sinned, instead of coming to God in humble repentance, I thought, I'll do better next time. Next time came, and I sinned again. They were like stains upon me, and the more I tried to wash them away, the darker I became. I couldn't see my way out of the works-based righteousness cycle I was trapped in. That was when God showed me the way out. At the last winter camp, Mr. Hantlin gave his testimony of how he was saved. As I listened to the way he described himself before conversion, all I could think was, this sounds exactly like me. I went up to him afterwards with several questions, and he answered them all. There, in the mountains outside of Payson, I finally repented of my sins and asked God to give me a new life in him. In the months since, yes, I have sinned. Conversion did not make me perfect, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I am now able to not sin. Instead of striving for myself and my own sinful desires, I strive to do all things to the glory of God. Sanctification may take a lifetime, but I pray that one day when I stand before the throne of God, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. This is why I want to be baptized. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Today, I proclaim to the body of Christ that I am a believer saved by grace and that Christ dwells in me. Hannah, based upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the, your testimony of a transformed life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Emma Branson, come tell us what Jesus has done for you. Hello, my name is Emma Branson. I grew up in the Baptist church raised by an amazing God-centered family who taught me the truths of the gospel and the importance of having a God in our lives from a very young age. Psalm 73, 28 says, but it is good for me to draw near to God that I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. To me, this verse is telling of the personal relationship we need to have with the Lord in order to grow in godliness and draw near to, near to God and trust Him. I feel for much of my life I understood and believed in Jesus and what I, I had been taught about Him but did not really make it a priority in my daily life to spend time with Him and have the type of God-centered life described in this verse. I recently got the opportunity to spend a couple months out of state away from my regular roles and responsibilities, breaking my previous routines and habits and forming new ones. I spent much time in God's word and evaluated what makes me feel closest to God from everyday activities to the type of church service and worship service that makes me personally feel closest to the Lord. After that, I came back home feeling eager to be baptized. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, died for our sins, and rose again on the third day. I chose to be baptized today to be obedient and to further identify with God. I recognize that I am not deserving of the unconditional love and grace of God offered to me through his sacrifice on the cross. I also do not deserve the unconditional love, spiritual guidance, and support given to me by my family and friends. I pray God uses me to be the same kind of blessing in their lives and others around me.
based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your testimony of a transformed life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are two Josies in our church. Uh, they're both being baptized today. So Josie number two, Josie Kyle, come tell us what Christ has done for you. Hello, my name is Josie Kyle, and I'm here today to share how Jesus saved my life. I grew up in a Christian home with parents who have taught and exemplified the gospel to me my entire life. Because of that, it's hard to pinpoint an exact come to Jesus moment. The only thing that's apparent is the time before I was saved. I used to be absolutely controlled by my intense anxiety and fear of man and need to have everything in my control and go according to my plan, not God's. I thought that me wanting everyone to like me was love and selflessness, and I used my knowledge of, the, of God's word to justify that. In actuality, I was selfishly wanting everyone else's approval and didn't actually care about, the, about God's opinion. I was so worried that people would think and see that I was not perfect, so I tried fighting my own sin and refused to actually give up my own efforts and fully trust in the Lord. Although I had been taught my entire life that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose three days later because he loves me, I never fully processed that he did that for me. It wasn't until my parents became aware of an unsafe situation that I had gotten myself into because I was so scared of displeasing one person that that fear turned into what that person would do to me. Once, I, once they found out and resolved the situation, I was confronted with the truth and dis, depravity of my own sin. I don't know when exactly I became a Christian, but I know it was some soon, sometime soon after that. I began to read my Bible more and actually grow in my own relationship with the Lord, knowing there is nothing I could bring to the table. I remember hearing worship song that was one of my favorites, and after that thinking this lyric has to be a verse, and it was. The verse was Matthew 6:34 which says, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That verse has been one of my biggest reminders that I don't need to worry about anything as long as I have the Lord with me. This is how I came to truly accept in my heart that I'm a sinner, and by God's grace, he loves me and saved me through the death of his son. Thank you. Josie, based upon your profession of faith and your testimony of a transformed life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for these. Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you for these who have given testimony of your grace. We thank you for the gospel which saves sinners. We thank you, O Lord, that you're still in the business of rescuing people who will turn to you in faith. Lord, we pray for these who have been baptized and ask that even as they have been bold today to tell the world about Christ and all that you've done, uh, we pray that you would use them for a lifetime as heralds of your grace to save the unlovely, to save the unworthy, uh, to rescue those who recognize their need. God, we pray for all of us today that we would be rejuvenated in our love for you as a response to your love for us. Thank you for the reminders of who we would be without you and the reminders of your immeasurable grace. Lord, we thank you for all your kindness to us, which comes to us through your son, Jesus, in his name, amen. I'd love for you to, it's me, it's not you guys. There's a button, I didn't push the button, it was me, that was not you guys. I made you look bad for a moment. Sorry about that. I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. 
the second half of our service today, we get to recognize those who are becoming members at Grace Bible Church. To be a member at Grace Bible Church, you have to be a believer in Jesus Christ, you have to have experienced new birth, and you have to have given testimony to that miraculous transformation in the waters of baptism. There are some today who are being baptized and becoming members on the same day. And then there's a a list of others who will become members today. All of these who are becoming members have uh, been through the membership class. They've heard the doctrine and the teaching and the philosophy of this church. Uh, They are in agreement with those things. They want to be under uh, what this church is about. And they've also met with one of the pastors of the church, one of the elders. Uh, They've given testimony to God's work in their life. Uh, They have expressed ways they are already serving in this church. Uh, Many of the people that will come forward today, no doubt you will recognize as participants in your small groups, servants in various ministries of the church already. Uh, They love this church. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4 for just a moment. One of the things we need to recognize is that church membership is not like a membership in a club. It's more like a part of a physical body being connected to the rest of that physical body. In fact, that is the primary metaphor for the church from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Uh, That metaphor shows up here in Ephesians chapter four. He says in verse three, be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body. What does he mean by that? He's referring to the church, this visible gathering, Uh, something like a physical body. You know that a physical body has many parts and they're all part of one physical organism. The church is to be like that. The church is to be like a physical body organism in that it has different parts. There, There are different shapes and different sizes. They have different functions and different abilities and yet they all come together as one functioning organism. That organism is to be interdependent and interconnected. We actually need one another. No part of a physical body could say, I don't need the rest of the body, dispense with them, I'm gonna be an elbow all by myself. That is why this body metaphor is critical to our understanding of what the church is. The church is not a social club that is populated by people with similar interests. The the church is, is not an entertainment venue where the operators of the venue dispense some product that consumers consume. The church is actually the gathering of regenerate people who see themselves as members of one another. Without one member, the whole body suffers. With a member of the body not operating properly, the growth of the body is stunted. That is the picture that Paul paints here. He describes one body, one spirit, verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And look down at verse seven. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. In verse 11, We discover that Jesus gave to the church some in the first generation as apostles and prophets. God gave to the church evangelists, and then God gives pastors and teachers. Why do leaders in the church exist? According to verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. The saints are all those set apart ones, the ones who belong to Jesus Christ. Who is it that does the ministry of the church? Is it the pastors of the church? No. The pastors exist to equip all of us believers to do the work of the ministry of the church. What is that ministry? It is found in verse 13. Our attaining to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, until we reach a maturity. How is that maturity measured? To the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That is, we individually and we collectively are all to be growing together until we look like Jesus. A work that is in process for all of us and for us as a group. As a result, verse 14, we're not to be children 
tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men or craftiness and deceitful scheming. In other words, we are to have discernment. But, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we together are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. And from Christ, verse 16, the whole body, being fitted and held together by every joint of the supply, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. What you need to understand from this metaphor for church membership is that being a part of a local church is the normal aspect of being a Christian. The Bible doesn't know of a follower of Jesus Christ unconnected to the local, physical, visible gathering of followers of Christ. There is a blueprint and a design, not only for following Christ, but for gathering together that Jesus has made. And those who follow Christ want to follow his design. And that design for the individual believer means not a casual commitment, uh, not a casual gathering with people, but an intentional gathering with God's people for the service of ministry. That is, speaking the truth to one another in love. All of the one another commands of the New Testament, serving one another, caring for one another, meeting each other's needs, praying for each other. It means being involved in each other's lives in a very intentional and, and in the process of a church membership, a very formalized way. It's a way to say, I belong to Jesus and I belong to Jesus' people. I belong with him and I belong with them. Those who are coming forward for church membership today are doing so because they desire to commit themselves to Jesus' blueprint for how to do church and for how to follow Christ to gather together to a local assembly of believers and follow Jesus' instructions. You understand that the church is what Jesus promised to build and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And the church becomes the vehicle by which Jesus takes his own saving message to the ends of the earth. A watching world gets to look in and see, that's a different kind of people. They're weird. <laughs> They're set apart. They do things differently. Uh, that is by God's design. So what we'll do now is I will read the list of names of people who are coming forward for membership. Uh, then they will come forward. Uh, then I'll invite everyone who is currently a member of Grace Bible Church to stand up. We're gonna put the church covenant on the screens on the front and back and we're gonna read that together out loud. It, it's a reminder of what it means to formally commit ourselves to one another in a body. And so uh, I will ask the, the member candidates to come forward. Gavin Butcher, Debbie Cottrell, Josie Cottrell, come on up when I read your name, Jill Drent, Chris Drent, Noor, um, I have Gonzalez here, but Noor, what your last name is? Say, say it one more time. Malokia. Malokia, thank you. Wanted to get that right. Greta Hull, Kyle Hull, Noah Kelso, Miriam Kershaw, Brigida McHenry, Isaiah Martin, Joshua Pena, Andy Ransom, Abigail Romo, Fernie Romo, Stephen Slayton, Deborah Trowder, Gary Trowder, Naomi Walsh, Jin Sha Wong. All right, let's put the church covenant up on the screen and let me invite all of you who are members at Grace Bible Church to stand together and we're gonna keep them company as they read the church covenant. You're gonna read it with them. We'll do this together. Here we go. Humbly trusting that God has graciously brought us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and having been baptized upon our profession of faith, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in dependence upon God's gracious help, solemnly enter into covenant with one another. We will pray for and be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the church, being a peacemaker with all in the church. We will walk together in brotherly love, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, 
faithfully encouraging, admonishing, and entreating one another as occasion may require, seeking with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows, being slow to take offense and quick to forgive and reconcile with one another. We will strive for the advancement of this church for Christ's sake by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, by remaining faithful to God's word concerning our biblical doctrines, church discipline, the Lord's table, and believer's baptism, by exercising the spiritual gifts given to us as members of the body of Christ, by giving cheerfully and sacrificially to support the gospel ministry of the church as it extends both into this community and the nations. We will seek to live boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ where God has placed us, living a transformed life and proclaiming the gospel that the mission of Jesus Christ might advance in this world. We will persevere in raising our children under God's watchful care, that they might, by His grace, repent and believe in the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ. We will, if we move from this church as soon as possible, unite with another local church where we can obediently live under God's word in fellowship and where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the body of Christ. Let's give a hand to these who are joining membership today. And I'd like to ask the elders who are in the room to come down. And uh, as I pray for them, the elders will then extend the right hand of fellowship. This will seal the deal and, uh, and they will be members. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your kindness to us, to bring us these dear friends in all the ways that you've gifted them with their varieties of backgrounds, varieties of testimonies of your grace, varieties of abilities, talents, and gifts that you have dispensed according to your sovereign purpose. God, you are so good. You know what this church needs. You have brought people with the gifts that you desire to be used here. I thank you for the way that these have desired to formally commit to membership in this church, to covenant together, to live as interdependent members. We thank you for the ways they are already serving in this church and that that service is bearing fruit. We pray that that would continue. We pray that you would use them mightily by your power to cause the growth of this church into discernment and maturity and the fullness of the stature of Christ. Lord, we pray that all of this would be done as we speak the truth to one another in love, that it would all be done for your glory and in an atmosphere of the kind of love that you have poured out in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We pray that we would be marked by gospel love until you return. Thank you for these in Jesus' name. Amen.